Everyone, good morning. We're going to look, as you heard here, um, salt and light. It says you, meaning you. It's not the other you. It's you are the salt of the earth, okay? There was a, a story one time, there were brothers that had a business, and they, uh, they were conniving. They treated people, they, they treated them very badly. They, they did everything they could to make money for themselves, and everybody knew it. Well, one of them passed away. And the other one thinking, well, maybe this is an opportunity here. He went to the pastor and he says, if you can say that my brother was the salt of the earth somewhere in the eulogy, I will give you a million dollars. I'll, I'll donate a million dollars to your church. And the pastor is like, oh man, how do I do that? Everybody knew your brother. They knew your brother, they know you. How can I say that? He goes, the offer stands, let me know. So the pastor thought about it. The next day he went in and he saw the guy and he says, you know what? He says, I will accept your offer. And the man says, great. So he stood up there and he says, today we're here to mark the passing of this man right here. Everybody knows he was a womanizer and an alcoholic and a cheat and no good and everything. But compared to his brother, he was the salt of the earth. <laughs> so where's my million dollars, he says. You are the salt of the earth. It's a compliment. When someone says that to you, Jesus was using it more of a, um, like kind of getting people out to go and to witness. You, if you're gonna call yourself a Christian, if you're gonna follow your, and say you're gonna follow me, you are going to be salt. And it, it really back then, see Jesus could, he had to talk about things that were, that people understood, because many of the people were not very educated and the ones that were educated he fought with. But the ones that were not that educated, like when he was talking to, sh to shepherds, he talked about sheep. When he was talking to fishermen, he talked about fishing, you know, and, and, and he tried to meet people and, and talk to them in terms that they could understand. Salt and light were, were absolutely important. Uh, and even today, salt, light are very important in our world. And when someone says you, are the salt of the earth. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that about me, but I'm hoping there's still time. You are the salt of the earth. It means that you in no particular order. It means that you are kind, helpful, loving, good to your mom, pillar of your church. Basically, you are a good egg in the long run. You are the salt of the earth. And it, it talks in here, it says, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Salt had, in Jesus' time, two particular, uh, oh, I guess you'd say, jobs that it did. Salt, it was used for flavoring. They would sprinkle salt on things and it would maybe add to the flavor of the, the things that they were eating. The, the, maybe the, the common people didn't have very much salt, but certainly it was a big market you know, for the, for the ruling people, the people that had money. So flavoring was a good one. Number two, salt was used to preserve things. They didn't have their stand-up Frigidaire GE freezer. They didn't have the little laid-down chest Whirlpool freezer to put things in. So whenever they got like extra meat or things, they preserved it by just salting it all, you know, just throwing the salt in, putting it in a pan and covering it up. And then whenever they got back to it, it should have been okay to eat. It was preserved. Well, Mark 9, Mark chapter 9, verse 50, 49 and 50. It says, everyone will be salted, but you will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. 
The salt of the earth, Jesus is talking about right here, the salt of the earth, one of the, the jobs that they would like to do is to go out among people and, and talk about peace and love and togetherness and forgiveness. The people, the person who is the salt of the earth is not somebody that's really going to cause trouble. It's a title almost that you have to earn. So he says, you are the salt of the earth, used for flavoring, used for preserving. Mark even backed that up. So salt symbolizes those things. Flavoring symbolizes preserving. But losing its saltiness, then it's done. You know, you were the salt of the earth. Boy, that, that would be a heck of a thing to say to somebody. You know, I remember when you were out doing really good things. You were, you, you were, the, people said you're the salt of the earth. But then you lost your saltiness. You, you lost your joy. You, you lost your love. And, and you forgot how to forgive people. Something must have happened in your life to take the saltiness out of you. And that's kind of a bad thing because Jesus says here, you know, when it loses its saltiness, it's done. How can it be made salty again? It is good for nothing except to be thrown out, trampled underfoot. Now, in Jesus' time, most of the salt that they used in Israel came from the Dead Sea area. Uh, we've been over the dead to see the Dead Sea and it's shrinking more and more and more. The, the water that is flowing into it from the Jordan River has been, half of it's been diverted to over into Jordan. So it's not getting as much water down there. And you could see, like if you look from the air, it almost looks like a bullseye where it was way out here and then it was here and then, and it, it's shrinking. And back then, this is where they went and they got the salt was from in and around the Dead Sea. But the problem with that was it was filled with impurities. You would get salt, you would scoop up this crusty stuff and, and put it in bags and put it on oxen or put it on donkeys and, and, and take it north and sell it. Well, because it had so much of these impurities, it was after just a short while, it would lose its qualities. It would lose its flavor. It would lose its preserving. And that's why the people that transported salt really would have a really good business because they knew that what they're bringing up wasn't going to last all that long. So they just kept salt coming up to Jerusalem, up to Jericho, uh, you know, from the Dead Sea. Salt today, as we said, can be applied to people. We are to be the salt of the earth now. Jesus is talking about all of us here in this passage. You are the salt of the earth. You are to go out and flavor your world. You are to go out and spice up a world that right now is like down. And even more so lately, it just seems that things are going on right now out in the world that are making people like uh, just they stay home. They, they don't want to be social anymore. They, they, it's almost causing isolationism. But if you are called to be the salt of the world, you have to go against that. You have to go out, uh, as young lady was talking this morning, you have to go out and say to people, I love you. When was the last time someone other than your husband or wife or kids or maybe someone in your family, when was the last time somebody looked at you and gave you a hug and said, you know what, I love you. We are hungry for that. And if you're gonna be the salt of the earth, as Jesus says, this is what we're called to do. We're called to go out and apply this spice, apply this flavor to the world that's out there. And, and the second thing, preserve. We're going to preserve what? Number one, we read about it and talked about it in Sunday school this morning. We have to preserve God's word. God's word is above all, it is uh, everything that we need. It is the, the uh, owner's manual to the people's soul that we have here. The Bible, God's word is coming under attack right now. 
There are Bibles being written, the politically correct Bible. There's the, the gay Bible. There's Bible that, that talks about mother, father, and, you know, in heaven. And they don't say that there's darkness because that offends our dark friends. And, you know, the, the, the Bibles that are out there now, so when somebody says to you, well, that's not what my Bible says, you have to really ask them, what Bible are you reading? because the NIV Bible, the King James Bible, the, the Word, all of the Bibles that are the traditional Bibles that we use, all of them say against what you're out preaching. And if you have the salt in you, as Jesus said we're supposed to have, then you have to go out there and preserve God's Word. That's it. Before we get off the of salt and we begin to look at light, and uh, there's a warning, of course. You lose your saltiness. You lose your desire to go out. If you have stayed home and you've watched uh, the, the, uh, the church services and things on your nice little screen when you're sitting there in your pajamas and you're able to eat Cocoa Puffs instead of coming in and having fellowship and eating a donut and things with people downstairs. If you are, are going to want to do that and you've lost your saltiness, how is it that you're going to get that saltiness back? How are you going to, to get that? Like, I mean, the answer would be certainly to get up on Sunday mornings to clean up, to put on your, your clothes, and to get into church and see people. But it, it seems like people are taken away from that now. They, a lot of people have lost their saltiness. They need to be contacted. That was a very good idea. Call somebody. Maybe somebody that had come here that was at the church and, and say to them, you know what, I have missed you. How's everything going? And before you hang up the phone, say, you know what? I have always loved you, and I wanted to call you and tell you that and invite you back. That's part of being salty. You are preserving God's word. You are preserving people and, and their ability to come back. You are inviting them back again. The third thing about salt, not totally in here, but Jesus does allude to it when he says you are salty and you need to go out and preserve things. Has anybody ever had like a, a paper cut or some kind of a cut and got salt in it? Anybody? Just me, huh? Oh, every, okay. How did that feel? Yeah, it kind of burned a little bit, didn't it? Kind of got irritated a little bit, didn't it? If you're going to be the salt of the earth, it is really very possible that we are called to be an irritant or cause something to, to call attention to something in this world because people just kind of float by and they see and they hear about these things, but they don't do or say anything about them. Salty Christians look at a wound that's out there. They look at something that is not right, and they go and they address it. And by doing that, you can irritate what's going on over here. You can call attention to this. When we see cuts or wounds, we need to irritate them. We need to bring attention to these things that are in our society. These are sores that are going to get worse if we don't do something about them. And the best way to do something about them is to call attention to them. This is what a salty Christian can do. And I don't mean salty going and cussing and yelling and causing a fuss, but just addressing the issue, educating people around you that there is this problem out there. We need to be irritated when it comes to talking about abortions. How many millions of babies are killed? It just seems now that that's all the rage, you know. Even though the, the Supreme Court made a ruling, people are still out there, you know, just uh, talking. And, and the abortions really haven't stopped. Millions and millions of people. Somebody said the other day, well, you know what, why don't God kill, why don't God, you know, heal the common cold? Why can't God heal some of the afflictions that we have in our life. And God says, I did. I sent somebody that had all that knowledge, but you aborted them. We need to bring attention. We need to, to talk about things that are uh, against 
what we stand for, the gay lifestyle is not, you know, the people, the gay people I have in our family. I, we have gay people, and I tell them, and I tell them that I love them, but I say to them, I cannot, uh, uh, you know, love and, and you know, the, the lifestyle that you're leading. Lifestyles, Deuteronomy, or I'm sorry, in uh, Le Leviticus, it calls uh, the homosexual lifestyle detestable. In Leviticus 20, it says, you shall be put to death. And Romans 132, it said people approved this lifestyle. They knew better, but they approved it, and he was going to just leave them over to themselves. That's coming for us. One day, God's going to say, you want all this stuff? Fine. Here you go. We're irritating churches that water down the gospel. Churches that, that teach feel-good, ear-tickling messages. You know, that, that people need to hear the gospel. People need to be convicted. The Holy Spirit, we talked about today in Sunday school, the Holy Spirit encourages and lifts people up and, and makes you really want to, to feel good about wanting to do God's work. The other side of that, though, is that it convicts you. You know, it makes you want to say, you know what, I'm going to leave here because of what I heard. I'm going to be a better person. I'm going to tell people I love them. I'm going to go and visit people. I'm going to call somebody that hasn't been here for a while and find out what's going on and invite them back to church. Watering down the gospel, it's becoming more and more. It seemed like a long time ago you had pastors and priests and, and all, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but they were, they were in a position of where they were, had authority and they were respected. And the people down here would like, oh, you know, they, in, our, in my time, the priests and, and all of those, they just had such a special place. Well, then over the years, they realized that if they water down the gospel a little bit, that maybe perhaps instead of elevating these people up to them, they would begin to sink back down to their level. And pretty soon it's going to be where they're even. And what's the point? If you're, not, if you're going to have a, a church service, you might as well be the rotary because you're going to be out doing really good deeds, but you're not going to be preaching the gospel. I've gone to churches that don't have Bibles in their pews. And I thought, what's going on here? Ah, oh, well, you know, everybody brings their own and nobody needs them. What about somebody that comes and forgets their Bible or you have a visitor that comes? You have to have Bibles in your church. You have to preach the gospel. Rampant crime is going on. Uh, and finally, holding fellow Christians accountable. Everybody knows that this people, these people are doing these kinds of things and, and you say something to them and they say, don't you be judging me. I'm not judging you. When the judgment list came down from heaven this day, my name wasn't on it. I'm not judging you. I am simply holding you accountable as a Christian person. You need to stop what you're doing. Everybody sees it and it's not right. You need to be an irritant by being an irritant to these people, the people that are out there trying to damage the country, and even more important, the people that are out there trying to damage God. If we lose that saltiness, if we just let stuff go on and just accept things as they are, uh, then if we give up, if we give up God's preserving work and then we don't do and we don't be spicy and want to go out and be different than the world. You want to be different than the world? Look at what the world's like now. Walking along, lonely, you know, depressed for the most part. Half of America is on some kind of antidepressant. I just read, I just heard this yesterday. The Christian person can go out there and be an antidepressant in the flesh. You can be a joyful person. You can talk about love and grace and peace and forgiveness. That's what God wants us to do when we say that we are the salt of the earth. And if you're not going to go out and do that stuff, or if you think that's somebody else's job, then you might as well just lay down because you're about to be trampled. If a salt loses its saltiness, Jesus says, it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. So that's salt. We need salt. Now, light. Jesus, light of the world. 
how many times he referred to himself as the light. Jesus himself fulfilled the mission of the Lord's servant to be a light for the Gentiles. Isaiah 42 talks about that. In chapter 2 of Luke, Jesus talked about that. I'm the light of the world. He expects his followers to carry on that work. If you're going to be with me and you're going to say that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, then the Holy Spirit is going to come down on you and he's going to go into your heart when you invite him. At that point, you are the light of the world and Jesus expects you to go out and act like it. He says in verse 14, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. He's talking about Jerusalem. Jerusalem is 2,300 feet above sea level. When you read the story of this good Samaritan, it says a man was traveling down from Jerusalem to Jericho. 2,300 feet above sea level to 900 feet below sea level. He is traveling down. So when he talks about you are a light on a town, on a hill. He's talking about the people right there in Jerusalem. You, you cannot be a town that is up there and be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father. How many people, uh, you see them walking around like, I said, well, what happened to your arm? And they said, oh, I went out and did something good. And when I was raising it up here to pat myself on the back, something cracked in my shoulder and it hadn't been the same since. When you do good deeds, and God wants us to, to do good deeds, show your light to others. Don't hide your light. And, and even worse, that somebody's like ready to use their light and you, you put a bowl over it. You know what, I think I'm gonna join the choir whenever the church comes back in the fall. You, you can't sing. Do you see that bowl just go over that light like that? You know, I'm gonna teach Sunday school. Well, which, what grade are you gonna teach? I think I'm gonna do like fourth and fifth grade. You are gonna, those kids are gonna know more than you. Bang. Somebody had a light that they were gonna use. When that bowl goes over it, that light goes out. Show your light to others. Allow other people to show their light. And then when someone says, hey, you really do a good job, tell them it is God working through me. You shine your light. And when people recognize that you're shining a light, you say to them, it is not me. Thank you. But all I'm doing, I am just so happy and proud that God allows me to take part in his plan because he could do this without me. But, but Praise the Lord that he lets me be a part of it. I am nothing with this. God is everything. That's how we have to, if you have the light of the Lord in your heart, that's what it means. Show your light and then give the credit to God. Don't always practice your righteousness. It says here in six, in, if you go over to the next chapter, in verse, uh, chapter number six, it says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. If you go out and you practice your righteousness and you go out and you practice your light and you show your light and you take the credit for it, that's all you're gonna get. You're getting your reward now. God's, God's gonna be like, oh man. Yeah, you, you had your chance. You could have said, I did it, but give the credit to God, but you didn't. The credit stopped here. Well, that's all the reward you're going to get. Show your light. Tell them that it is God working and, and righteousness. You practice your righteousness in front of others. Righteousness comes in many forms. It comes in giving. When you give, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. It's not a big show. Whereas the Pharisees would say, oh Lord, I'm giving all this money to you. You should be happy I'm on your team. And he puts the money in. And they called them hypocrites. Hypocrite in Greek means play actor. 
And Jesus saved his worst criticisms for those that were hypocrites. Another way you show your righteousness is by praying. The, the, uh, when in Matthew 23, one of my favorite chapters whatsoever in the Bible, you want to read a really good chapter, read Matthew 23. Jesus says, you know, you can practice what they preach, but, but, or you can practice what they say, but don't practice what they preach. These, these people would go out and stand in the temple court, and they would stand there, oh, Lord, oh, blah, 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 our Lord, and everybody would go, Rabbi, Rabbi. That's what they wanted to hear. They wanted to hear adulation to them because they were out there praying on a street corner. They would go out there, and they would babble. And yet people said, oh, did you see he was out there and he prayed, it was really nice. God says, go to your room, close your door, get down on your knees. If you wanna pray in church, that's fine. Get here early, the church is open. You can come in and sit down somewhere and you can pray. We brought these prayer shawls with us back from Israel and it's, it's what the, they use whenever they have the Sabbath or whenever they're doing any kind of uh, festivals. It, it really looks, it, it kinda looks like a really fancy table like doily cover and it's got the tallit on the end of it, the little tassels. You put that over your head and you put your head down and you pray. They have a word for that in, in Hebrew that means going into your closet. That's how we should pray. People go on the street corners and stand. And then the, finally, the last one we heard about it this morning, fasting. Fasting, is it's not directed in the Bible. I mean, we're not commanded to do but we do want to fast to show that I'm gonna give up parts of things and, and Lord, uh, with the hope that you will answer these prayers. Not everybody can fast. We heard, you know, people have to eat to take medicine. You know, so for somebody to wake up in the morning and not eat the whole entire day until they get up the next morning is, is tough. If you can do it, God love you, do it. Don't be bragging about it. You know what, I'm really hungry today because I fasted all day yesterday. Nobody wants to hear that. You know, they, oh yeah, yeah, good, that, that's nice. Oh, oh, yeah, that's really nice. You want to fast, Jesus says, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites. Put oil on your hair, clean yourself up, dress yourself in your nice tunics and go out among the people. You don't want to go out like, oh, I haven't eaten for three days. You know, when you fast, when you want to show your righteousness before people, don't be somber. Make sure that you know what you're doing and you can bet that God knows what you're doing. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Father in heaven, Matthew uses that term 17 times in his gospel. Father in heaven, God in heaven. Uh, Mark and Luke each use that term once in their gospel. John uses it not at all. Matthew was just convinced that when you pray to the Father in heaven, that you are praying to the one true God. This is what he says right here, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Uh, I was on a borough council in Waynesburg and they had to clean out the big drain sewer pipes or whatever. They get just filled up and they have to go periodically and run things through them and they clean them out. So I was somehow, I was put in charge of this. I don't know how, but they just gave me this job. So I was working with the people and they got everything done. They went through and they cleaned everything out, all the roots and all the dirt and everything. And then they went in and they, they had something that sprayed like this concrete stuff in to try to seal up the pipe. And then they would go and they drop something down in and it had a camera on it and they would take it from manhole to manhole and you would look and you would see like that they did their job. So they took it and they put it on the big screen at the borough council meeting and somebody says, holy mackerel, what is that? What kind of a light did you use down there? That looks like a big floodlight. And the guy says, no, he said, actually the light that we use down there is the bulb that you take out of the dome in your car. The one that's about this big 
And they're like, wow, that's really bright. And he says, well, when there's total darkness, even a little light will make a big difference. That's what we have to think about. You say, oh my gosh, what can I do out there? All these things that are going on, how, how can I make a difference? Hezekiah thought that. He was being gonna be sieged in Jerusalem and he's like, we gotta have water. So he started people, two construction people. They started from this end, solid rock, and they started from this end, solid rock. And they just moved and they cut solid rock. No grafts, no engineers, no OSHA, no anybody. They just went over and in a very short amount of time, they got, and it was amazing, they got, we walked through Hezekiah's tunnel. It's 18 inches wide and about six football fields long. Total darkness. These people got where when you get to the one tunnel for this way, you take one step like this and then you go. That's how close they got. If God isn't involved in something like that, making darkness, then you go down and you take your little lamps with you and, and all of a sudden that total darkness, even a little bit of a lamp, makes a big light. You just have to make sure you don't drop your flashlight in the water because then you're out of, out of light. You have to hold on to the person in front of you. But a little bit of light makes a big difference, a major difference. So what he's saying here today, go out and be that light. You can go out and be that light. So he gives us two directives. We go back here. Salt. You are the salt of the earth. That means that we need to go out. We need to use salt. We need to, to be its qualities. We need to be uh, flavorful. We need to have seasoning. And we need to preserve. Preserve God's word. Preserve God's lifestyle in this uh, in, in this world right now. If you don't, you will be trampled. Nobody wants to be trampled. We need to keep the faith. You are to be salty and you are to be light. Light is essential. In a world where darkness rules and the darkness is getting bigger and, and more and more and more prominent every day, light is needed. Any light will bring God's light and it'll knock out that darkness. Men do their deeds because they don't want God to see them, they think, so they do them in the darkness. We can, we can get rid of that darkness if we are light. So those are your instructions here. When you leave today, go out and be salt and go out and be light. And when you do that, you will do the best thing that we can do, give glory to God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You've given us our instructions, salt and light. May now we go out after this service and take them seriously and start using them for your glory. Amen.